You know, Peg said about her kids. And letting them know when they already know about God, about Christ, about salvation. You don't have to preach at them. But you have to remind them. You have to, this come up in Sunday school and it's come up many, many times, but you have to let the Holy Spirit guide you. There are those who, if you continually preach at them, they're going to avoid you, they're going to stay away, you're going to push them away. But sometimes they just need reminded. You know, sometimes it's enough to say, you know what the answer is. We all, I'm sure we all have family, who knows, but is not doing? And sometimes it's enough to say, you know what the answer is. And let the Holy Spirit work. It is important that we continually let them know. But we don't have to continually preach at them. They know. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I know our family knows. Like I said, her kids know. I'm sure others have family who knows. They know the truth. But it's kind of like what we talk about in Sunday school. They avoid thinking about it. Mm -hmm. They stay in circles where they don't have to think about it. Yeah. But if you will take notice, as soon as something bad goes wrong, who do they come to? <coughs> Why do they do that? Because they know. That's right. And when they do that, then we need to remind them that they know. Mm -hmm. And let God work. It's so crucial that we let the Holy Spirit guide us. I know, and I'm not going to say this or that about it. But I know growing up, and I've seen in other people and heard from other people, that people are taught how to witness and how to reach people. I'm not going to say that's wrong. What I'm going to say is, get the knowledge, get the information, but when you speak, let the Holy Spirit guide your speech. There is no set formula to reach someone for Christ. There is no set formula to uh, bring them to that point where they're finally going to give in. You have to let the Holy Spirit guide you. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say about that. I just felt the need to put that out there. We're going to begin in the book of Luke, in chapter 11. We'll talk a little about prayer today. But let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go to the scripture. Lord, once again as we look into your word I ask that you would speak. Or I pray that it's not the words of my lips that are heard, but the voice of the Spirit that is heard. That each and every one of us can receive what you have for us. That we can take it in and apply it. That we can use it. Lord, that it would benefit us and therefore benefit you and the kingdom. Help us, Lord, to understand and to use wisdom and apply that truth that you give to us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying at a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. 
And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're going to go further, but I want to stop there and, and just make a few points here before we go on. We also have an account of this uh, in Matthew chapter 6. And over in Matthew chapter 6, there are some things said that aren't said here. Um, when the disciples came and asked the Lord to teach them to pray, uh, what Christ gave them was a model prayer. Uh, he wasn't telling them to repeat these exact words. And when you repeat these exact words, uh, then you pray a good prayer. But if we go and we look at Matthew 6 along with this, what we see is Christ said, pray after this manner. And what did he mean when he said to pray after this manner? He said that these are the things that uh, should be included when you talk to God. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because uh, there's a, another point that I really want to get to. Uh, but what he is saying is when we pray, uh, and we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But we have to give God glory. We have to recognize who God is. Um, when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, we are recognizing that he is the God of the universe, and he is holy, and he is righteous, <coughs> and, and he is deserving. And we recognize that when we come to God. And a lot of time when uh, Christians come to God, they don't really recognize that. And you've heard it many, many times. But a lot of us come to God as the piggy bank. A lot of us come to God as the genie. Uh, a lot of us come to God as the complaint department. Uh, but when we come to God, we have to come recognizing who this is that we are talking to and we have to approach him uh, with the respect that he is worthy of. We have to approach him uh, with the awe, uh, with the understanding of who this is I'm talking to. Uh, and that has to be not actually spelled out and said that way, but it's a, it's a mindset, it's a heart set on the way we approach God. And we pray uh, for his will to be done. A lot of time when we come to God, we're not praying for his will to be done. We're praying that my will will be done. God give me this and God do that because I want it. Uh, we have to pray that his will will be done. Recognizing who he is and praying for his will to be done. It says in here and also in Matthew, on earth as it is in heaven. I'm not into the word of God, but I'm going to say this is included in the word of God and in me. Thy will be done in earth as in heaven. I'm in earth. And I need his will to be done in me. Uh, there's a scripture that says, uh, and I'm not quoting it exactly, but it says there, uh, that the Holy Spirit make his intercession for us, for we know not what we are to pray for. But he makes the intercession for us with groanings which, not, which cannot be uttered because the Spirit knows the will of God. So that prayer is for the will of God to be done in our lives. And again, like I already said, a lot of time when we come to God, we're coming to him as uh, the piggy bank, the genie, the complaint department. Uh, we're coming and asking that our will be done. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes on and, and he talks about praying to God to meet our needs. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, that's praying to God and recognizing where things come from. I don't have anything that I have except God allow me to have that that I have. That's, right. uh, that's from my air I breathe to the food I eat to the clothes I wear uh, to the place I live. They were all blessings of God. Uh, God can remove all of that mm -hmm. if he so chose to do so. Uh, I need to recognize uh, where things come from and to seek God for what I need. Amen. It goes on, it says, and forgive us our sins for, and that for could be translated because, 
We also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Uh, if we go over to Matthew and we read over there where the Lord's Prayer is over there, uh, he goes on and he says, If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you. We cannot go to God and ask uh, for forgiveness if we are not willing to forgive. That's right. If we're not willing to forgive, God will not forgive us. That's what Christ said. That's right. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. If there is unrepentant sin in our life, our prayers are going nowhere. And we need to remember and understand that. We can't just live however we want to live, do what we want to do, and then come to God and expect Him to do everything we ask Him to do. It doesn't work that way. That's right. But here's the part I, I want to go on now. This is the point that I really wanted to get to. He's talking about prayer. He says all of that, and then he keeps going, and he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and he shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now I want to back up and take a look at a few things here. Christ is talking about prayer. He's talking about the model prayer, uh, the things that should be included in our prayer, how we should approach God, the things that we should recognize when we pray, that we should come to Him with a clean heart, having forgiven trespasses against us, and, and all of those things. And then He keeps going and He, he tells this story about the man who went to his neighbor at midnight uh, to get something to feed to somebody else. Uh, why did he do that? He's trying to tell us something here. And uh, what is it that he's trying to tell us? Uh, this friend went to his neighbor and he knocked and his friend said, I'm in bed, leave me alone. I, I ain't going to do it. Uh, but he didn't give up and he kept knocking. And it says in here in verse 8, Though he will not rise and give him because of his friend, but because of his importunity he will rise and give it to him. What is his importunity? You know what that means? Persistent boldness. That because he was persistent and because he was bold, uh, he will give him what he needs. I'm going to give you this real quick. Over in Hebrews chapter 4, you know the scripture beginning at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, what that means there, come boldly, means to come with assurance and confidence. That's what that means. Going back to where we were in Luke, he said because of his importunity, because of his persistent boldness, uh, because he was persistent, uh, because he came with confidence and assurance, he knew if he kept knocking, that guy was going to get up and that guy was going to give him bread. So he persisted. And the Bible tells us that we can come to the throne of grace boldly, uh, that we can be persistent and confident. We have to know within our heart that this word is true. What's that got to do with it? This word says that if I come boldly, I will receive. Uh, what Jesus just said here said that if I am persistent, uh, then I will receive. He went on and said after that, ask and ye shall find, seek and knock, and all those kind of things. He was, what was he telling us? Don't give up. 
Come with confidence. Come with boldness. Now, I want to tie this together with what I said at the beginning. It matters how you pray. Mm -hmm. Also, over Matthew, it says, Use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they will uh, be heard for their much speaking. And I've used this example before, but I'm going to use it again. Because growing up, I heard prayer, and when I went and tried to pray, I felt like I was talking to the wall. Because here's what I heard and I tried to model. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we so humbly bow before you, I'm going to quote the King James Bible to you. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. And I thought that's how I had to pray. But nothing ever happened. That was vain repetition. I need to talk to God from my heart. That's right. Yeah. Amen. You need to talk to God from your heart. Mm -hmm. And it matters, like I said, how you approach him. You have to recognize and realize who you're talking to. Like I said, we come to him as the complaint department, the genie, the, the piggy bank, whatever. We wouldn't even talk to our bosses a lot of time the way we talk to God. We need to realize and recognize who we're talking to. We need to recognize uh, that he is the provider, that he is the sustainer, that he is all. We need to realize and recognize that. And we have to come to him uh, with a clean heart, uh, with a pure heart, and with an open heart. Mm -hmm. And that's how we need to come and present uh, whatever it is that we need to present. That's how we come to God. And Christ said, if we do that and we're persistent, we can ask, we can seek, we can knock, and we will receive. Now, you've heard this over and over and over again, and you know this to be true. When we present those things to God, He's not going to, always going to answer the way we want him to answer. That's right. Because going back to what I've already said, that's my will, mm -hmm. not his will. That's right. But if we pray for his will to be done, I can guarantee you it is the best answer you could get. Whether you recognize it at the time or not, whether you realize it at the time or not, it is the best thing that could happen. If it's the will of God, uh, the Bible tells us in another place, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are the call according to his purpose. It may not look good at the time, but the end result is something good. The end result brings about what God wants to bring about. A lot of times, we give up on God. Uh, we aren't persistent. Uh, we aren't confident. Uh, we aren't bold. The Bible says we can be bold. Now, bold doesn't mean arrogant. Bold doesn't mean pushy. Uh, bold doesn't mean uh, that you dictate to God anything. Bold means with confidence. And how can I have that confidence? The Bible tells me what God will do when I come the way I need to come. I can have boldness because I know God said it will work. There are a lot of times we will come and we'll pray and we don't see anything happen and we quit and we give up and we need to not give up. I want to read you a couple scriptures in a couple different places just to make the point. Uh, if we go to the book of Matthew in chapter 20, <clears throat> breaking in at verse 29, everybody notice these things I'm going to going to read. You know these accounts. Uh, it says. As they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed them. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. I want you to recognize they cried out. And that has a lot in it. It was from the depths of their need. It was from the depths of their desire that they uh, called on Jesus. And it goes on, it says, And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. Uh, listen, a lot of time when we go and we pray and we seek after God, uh, we need not to go fall back into that uh, quote scripture to God and, and try to say things just right in the formula. We need to cry out from the depths of where we are. 
whether it's a pain, cry out from that pain. Uh, whether it's a longing, cry out from that longing. And a lot of times when we do that, it 